She's taught at Penland, Santa Fe Clay, Aramont, and a number of other places throughout the United States. Um, she's about to get started, just like leaving within a week for uh, Kiev in Ukraine, and she's doing some traveling and researching there. And then she's off to Sri Lanka, and so she has a combination of a studio life and a traveling life where she's learning and making. And so here's Jenny to tell her her story. Hi, everybody. Make sure you can hear me. Um, as well, I want to thank the John Anderson Endowed Lecture Series. I can't see. <laughs> I want to thank Liz for hosting me. Um, uh, Liz is a colleague that I met several years ago um, in a work situation, and we've become uh, friends and also uh, mutual admirers of each other, I think. Um, I'd like to thank Chuck for setting everything up and for her amazing organizing. I feel like I'm at the Oscars here. Um, <laughs> Shannon and Chris Daly. Haven't talked to you yet, but hopefully after the lecture. So, hello. Oh, sorry? Okay. Excuse my awkwardness. I am a full-time studio artist. I'm not um, used to lecturing, although I have to do it from time to time, so there might be a few awkward moments, and if that happens, just think about yourself if you were in a situation like this, and if you were caught up in it, and, and send me some good thoughts. Anyway, um, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, in case you don't have a sense of where that is, even though everybody knows their geography, it's about four hours from here. I was born there and um, little. This is a shot that I like to uh, put into my slideshow because it's, you know, before I knew anything. You know, at the point where you guys are, where I am, we're such a full slate, but there was some point where we were really empty, and I like to try to remember that and go to back to that place at times. Anyway, um, as a little exercise for, m sorry, for myself recently, um, to remember context and ch just try to get back to basics. I went to the house that I grew up in and I thought it would be really interesting to walk the walk that I, because I lived in the same house for 18 years and I pretty much grew up in a neighborhood where everybody stayed the same. I know that everybody, a lot of people now are really transitory and people move around a lot, but at the time that I was, sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. At the time that I was growing up, what's going on? I don't know. It's what? just me, probably. Okay, let's do this. Can I just click forward? Is that a possibility? Yeah, go to view. View? Mm -hmm. And what? Um, you should go to slideshow. Which is where? Right slideshow? There. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now just click? Yep. Okay, this would be better. This would be a lot better. Sorry about that. Anyway, I had this idea, and I've had it for a really long time, that I wanted to walk to school. I wanted to have a sense of context for myself, and I wanted to feel it in my body. So I went back to the house that I grew up in, and well, it looks a little bit different. It's a little bit spiffier. The windows are changed. The driveway is wider. The tree seems like it's older and more sparse. It felt really good to walk the walk that I did to remember the place on the corner um, where there was a woman that I was afraid of, but there was a tree that, w that held the first precious objects that I ever really thought about in that context, which were Buckeyes. Ohio is the Buckeye State, and if you don't know what Buckeyes are, they're the seed of the tree, but they also, that has a kind of thorny outside, but you can break it open, and inside there's this incredibly shiny thing. And when we were in school, we would bring those to school, and they would be incredibly sacred objects. So that's probably the first time I ever thought about something that way. And as I was walking to school and reimagining the walk, I walked up this hill, which for me was incredibly steep, but you can see it's not very steep at all. And I probably only had about a two block walk. And I remembered when the cement was laid and people walked in it, which of course you're not supposed to do, but it was so incredibly tempting. And I actually do remember when this was wet. So it was really kind of a fun experience for me. You know, I think that we get so detached 
from our past, but when you're able to have the opportunity to walk back through it, it can be a really powerful thing. And the reason I'm step on a crack and you break your mother's back, I don't know if you did that, but that was part of um, my vernacular. And so I'm going to school, I'm 53 right now, so this is the 60s, middle of the 60s, or late 60s. And the reason I wanted to walk to school was, my elementary school was where I actually have my first clear memory of a really powerful um, artistic experience. And it was outside of what the teacher was doing. I had a friend who I thought was an artist, and I have a very clear memory of remembering that. And we would work together every day in a kind of collaborative way and, and make things. And I looked forward to it. It was really exciting to me. And I don't remember any other experience in my whole elementary education that was exciting as that. So I think for me, um, being an artist started at the very beginning, although I never necessarily thought of myself as one. I was having artistic experiences, you know, before I could even think of having that. And <clears throat> sometimes my work references personal experience. Often, it, often it's a lot more visceral. But going back on this path, it reminded me of a time uh, when I was probably about eight years old and I got flashed by our neighbor. And then uh, during one of the residencies when I had time to reflect on, you know, had time to think about different kinds of work, I made a piece about that. And it wasn't a traumatic experience, it was just um, more of an awareness, I would say. So when I think about being an artist, aside from my kindergarten experience, I had a, a closet in my bedroom where I would consider my first studio and um, a secure place, a safe place to work. And even now, my studio that you'll see later in the slide presentation is pretty small and it kind of references that space. And another early memory that I had was a house that was on my street that I would drive by on the way to school or walking by. And my mother would always say with a kind of reverence that that was the artist's house. And I didn't know what that meant, but somehow, clearly, uh, it got inside my psyche. So it was kind of fun to go by there now as an adult and look at it. In my life, um, <clears throat> my, grandfather ha my grandmother had a really profound influence she was a maker of things, even if it was simple, little dolls. I think that having the imagination to make something from nothing is still something that I put into my work. And this was actually for my brother. It was my brother's doll. We both had one, but it's the one thing that survived um, throughout the time. And this is a portrait of my mother that was in my grandmother's house that also gave me some sort of feeling about being an artist because I knew that an artist made this portrait. And then when I was probably about eight years old, I sat for a portrait and I was in the presence of an artist. And it was, it was a thoughtful experience for me and it got, it got into my blood. So um, I'm a full-time ceramic artist now I never intended to go into this field. The only time I did ceramics as a kid was in seventh grade. I made that one piece on the right. And so I didn't really have a very strong feeling about clay at all until I, was <clears throat> until I checked it out when I was in college. And on the left is a piece that I remade, kind of a rethinking of that earlier piece. Oops, well, anyway, that's what that was. When I was in high school, I, it was the 70s, and I, for some of the time I was there, I was in an alternative program, but I also had a chance to be in an incredible art program where there were people that I was completely in awe of. <clears throat> and I never felt that I was quite at their level, but on the other hand, it really led me to do a lot more than I would ever do. And so during that time, we had, uh, once a week or once every couple of weeks, we had something that we called critique. And you were supposed to work on your own and make a painting. And I had, this is my grandmother, I had no idea at all how to paint, but somehow I had the confidence to tell my parents I needed a big canvas and I needed some paints and I was gonna make that painting because I wanted to swim with those bigger fish. And later on, I as well in college used her as an example because she was, she was the thing that inspired me the most. This is another painting that I did in college. I'm <clears throat> sure it was influenced by Chagall.
I unfortunately don't have any examples of my early work as a ceramicist. Um, a lot of things happen. I know the first kiln that I ever had work in completely collapsed. So I have no, I learned early that you can't really be that precious about things. But after I was in college, <coughs> I had a chance to go, I heard about Penland School of Crafts. And you know, it's really hard to imagine now what life was like before the internet. But I, I heard word of mouth about Penland School of Crafts and I thought maybe that's something I should do because I had no idea. I went to art school, I finished my BFA, but I had no guidance. I had very little instruction and I had no idea where to go next. And I heard about this school and I went there and I took a two month concentration and it was a great and profound experience for me. And I was able to go back there as a scholarship student and work for two years in my early 20s. So my earliest work was all hand-built ceramics. It was um, coil-built, for those of you in the clay class. I was inspired by a lot of different things. I was inspired by painters and pre-Columbian work and primitive artwork, oceanic artwork. and just being a woman as well. The next few slides, so I, um, because I don't have a lot of pictures of that early work, what I do have is what I left at my parents' house over the years, which have become my archives, and unfortunately they've broken most of everything that they have, but I was able to go back there recently and take a few pictures of what they have. And you can see from my earliest work, I always had a certain sense of my own style and I think that I, I told the students yesterday that was because I was in a program where I had a professor who wasn't particularly interested in the students and he just left us to our own devices and so I drew from myself from the very earliest uh, moments of my working. These are some pieces that I made at Penland School at that time just working with animals really simple pattern not a huge palette, as you can see, of colors and gesture and stuff I was just feeling inside myself. And since that time, I had a lot of different jobs, odd jobs, and um, I tried to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And because I had friends that were selling their work, I realized it was a viable possibility. And these are just some shots, uh, reference shots, of what I was surrounded with as a kid. Um, I started to work, I need to get to a certain point, sorry, here. Um, I started to work on my own work, develop a body of work, and sell it throughout the country. So flash forward here, and this is where I'm living now, in Northeast Ohio. I live in the country. I live on five acres of land. I have a little studio behind my house, and I am a full-time working ceramic artist, which is not the easiest thing to do, but it's not impossible, and it's actually a great, uh, it's been a great life for me. I live in a house that was built from salvage materials. Um, in Cleveland, in the early 1900s, in the eight, late 1800s, there were some incredible mansions, and when the recession hit, they tore them all down and they salvaged the parts and somehow this little house that I live in, which is really a little cottage, um, was built from all kinds of salvaged materials that were torn down from that time. So it kind of looks grand from this scale, but it's actually incredibly small. <coughs> I wait, I want to go back. Well, anyway, um, so this is some early work that I did. I, I kind of had a line of production work. This was a piece that was monumental for me. It was a, a shape that I made that I thought totally had no form, but th this is going to speak to my way of working. Um, I kept it on a shelf. It was one of those things that you have, or like a painting that you have that's unfinished, and you really don't know how to finish, and it was just a blank slate. And I had this kind of rotten thing happen. I broke my leg. And um, this is just a, oh, hold on one sec. Um, sorry about that. Um, I broke my leg and so I couldn't really move from the house and I needed to work a little bit 
and I just meditated on this piece and I, I found a solution to it from nothing. And for me, it's, it's one of the things I'm most pleased with because I was able to take something from nothing and, and put a total essence into it. This is some other production work I made. I, I used to make covered jars, simple design, not a lot of painting, just black and white. This is a little bit out of context, a little bit older because there's color shown in there. But all of my work is about nature. It's very intuitive. It's thoughtful, but it doesn't come from a, a concept first. It comes from basically inside my heart first. I know that's really not the way that you work here, but it's the, well, from what I've gathered. But I mean, I, I come from a different place and I, I, I feel really good about my work and where it's coming from. I work a lot in series. Um, because I'm in the marketplace, I've had to figure out and develop uh, different sorts of things that, that, that my public is interested in and that they collect. These are cups that have two sides to them, two faces. And I make a lot of masks. And odd objects. This was actually part of a salt and pepper set that I made. So I like to reference things that people understand because that, that's a way for them into the piece. Although to me, it's not really important that they use it as that. But it's just a common piece of language that can help them not put up a, a barrier before they look at it. So this is all some older work. And you can see going forward that more and more I became a painter, more of a painter in my work. When I was in college, the reason I went into ceramics was um, I really wanted to be a painter, but I was, I think, a little bit intimidated about being a painter. And so I took a random ceramic class, and it was sort of fun, and a friend got me into it. And then I thought, oh, I don't know. What, you have to declare a major. How do you know what to do that? You know, how do you, how do you know what to declare? And so I went into ceramics. And because I had no um, experience in it, I was wide open for it. And because I had a teacher who was really not instructing, I think that for some people it probably would have been a horrible situation. But for me, it was a chance to, to find my own work from the very beginning, to not have any influence, you know, to trust my own instincts. And I would say about the teacher that I had, um, he taught me how to work. And that's continued to be a really a strong force in my life today. I work pretty much six to seven days a week. Um, maybe not as much on the weekends, but from 10 to 6 or 7 during the week. And I'm, I'm very disciplined uh, about the way I've gone about my work. This is a collaborative piece that I made uh, with a friend. He made the piece and I painted it, a teapot but not really a teapot. So, flash forward, I'm about in my early 40s, and as Liz had said, I, I got a couple grants from the state of Ohio, and um, because of that, I had an opportunity to apply for a residency, and I'd never thought about residencies before that time. I was just, you know, trying to survive in my studio, working away like a little gerbil, and I applied for a residency at this place in California called the Headland Center. And I didn't get it, and I was really, I guess I really needed a change in my life, and I hadn't realized how much I needed a change. So on the rebound, I applied to Penland School of Crafts, which I had been familiar with, which, where I had been in my 20s, which had been a, a comfortable and good place for me. So they have a three-year residency there for emerging artists, for people in all different stages of their careers. And I applied for it and I got it. And I really applied just to go through the process of applying. I didn't even expect to get it. I didn't even want it. But um, I got a call on New Year's Day and they said, oh, well, uh, we picked you for the residency. So what, you know, so how do you feel about that? And I, I went through a, a kind of crisis because I was, I probably was 43 at the time. And I thought, I have my life. You know, I've, I've got my house, I've, everything's going along, everything's cool. You know, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I want to do this. 
and I don't know if I can commit for three years. And, you know, for most people, they'd probably get the call and they'd be like, great, <laughs> you know, that's what I was looking for. But for me, it was a, it was a whole different situation. So I, I went through a lot of thinking about it and I realized, you know, I could say yes, and if it wasn't right, it, it, would, be okay to, it would be okay to leave. Um, so I went to Penland School of Crafts, which is a great place in North Carolina. If you've never heard of it, they, it's multidisciplinary. There's workshops in the summer. They also have long t uh, two month workshops in the spring and fall. And I lived there for three years. And it was, a, it was a great time for me. I was able to continue on with my work. I was able to um, collaborate and have conversations with different colleagues. It's, as you can see in my house, I work in a really kind of quiet, isolated way in place. And so it was great for me to be out among people. And I thought about, you know, because the, most of the people I was with were a little bit younger, but I had this really strong idea before I went there that I wanted my studio to be kind of a salon, and I worked really hard to, I'm, I wasn't used to living around people, but I thought, I'm going to get along with everybody, no matter what. That was kind of a goal of mine. And so, because as well the bathroom was in my studio, everyone was always passing through my studio, and every, everybody would stop and talk, and it was a really great gathering place. So I continued uh, with my production work, and um, I'm married as well, and my husband came down to, this, to Penland for the part of the time I was there, and just putting a little word out for him, he's helped me a lot with my production work, and he also helped me, while I was there, he helped build a little gallery in my studio so I could be able to afford to be there, and, and it sustained me. Some of the work I worked on when I was at Penland was a series of drawings in clay, um, just drawn with an X-Acto blade, drawing through slips, and a lot of the imagery uh, was personal. Things that were going on in my life this was a piece uh, about the dog that I had at the time who was dying, working through different things, but some of it was just kind of general. I really enjoyed this process, and because I had the time at Penland to kind of develop a body of work in this way, I spent a lot of time doing this. And it was work that I wasn't necessarily selling, but I've always, I always felt really positive and powerful about it, and for me, the marketplace, I feel like it's my job to sell my work, the part of it that I believe in. I, I want to be the one that drives it, not necessarily what people want. And so even though for a long time I wasn't selling these tiles or images of what I was doing, slowly it kind of caught on. And um, eventually other people started liking it a lot as well, as much as I did. I'm really connected to nature um, and animals. I don't have children, but I would say my, my relationships with animals are really important as well, and I brought that into my work. Sometimes random things inspire me, pretty much anything. This was inspired by uh, a photograph in the Financial Times or politics. I think this was during the election, um, last second election of George Bush. Or fleeting feelings I just grab onto, but not necessarily having words to talk about them. Or something fun. or something that was going on on campus, just a way to get it out. I also worked on sculptural work while I was there. I'd say that <clears throat> the way that I used the residency was to make more elaborate pieces, take more time, because I was at Penland and it, uh, there was a lot of opportunity to be able to sell work to the students or the public. It's kind of a tourist area. Um, 
I was able, able to not work so much on smaller pieces and work on bigger work. So that was a great opportunity to me. It's hard as a full-time artist, you can't always do what you want to do. But it's nice to take time out and do residencies and you know, go down some of the different avenues that you haven't had a chance to explore. <clears throat> I've also been inspired very much by aboriginal, certain aboriginal painters, and so I took that element into my work as well. Sometimes you also don't know what you might like to do. Because of all the, the dotting I was doing, I, my work became a lot more of a meditation for me. So slowly, I think probably while I was at Penland, um, I started taking the drawing and painting uh, in, in a more illustrative way into the surface of my work. This is part of uh, sort of a production. These are a, a set of salt and pepper shakers. And all the pieces that you're seeing here, they're, for anyone that's interested technically, they're low fire terracotta clay. The surface is terra sigillata, lots of different colors that I make, and a little bit of underglaze. These are salt and peppers also. Um, like I said before, in my studio I created a little gallery space, and that's, that's where that window came from. And I took the uh, dotting a little bit further. This was probably something I had, took a couple weeks to work on, and I, I loved the effect, but I also realized I didn't have the time um, to go that far in a piece. So this is all work during that time period. And um, this is Paulus Berenson, who is a friend of mine, kind of a mentor, but not exactly. Um, more somebody that I found uh, when I was working at the school, when I was in my early 20s, who understood what I was doing and was supportive. And it's always great to find somebody like that in your life. It's not necessarily who your teacher is, but and I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily a devotee of the kind of work that he does, but it was great for me to find a person who said, you know what you're doing, it might not be what anyone else is doing, and it might be off the beaten path, but it's okay. Go for it, keep going. So he was a friend of mine, he lives down in the area, and while we were at the school, when I came back as a resident, we did a little of uh, some collaboration together. He's one of the people who got me interested in Aboriginal art. Oops. Sorry. And the next few pieces are a few pots that he made that I painted on and that we donated to the school for different fundraising purposes. And these are pinch pots. And the great thing for me, I think he really didn't know what, he had these ideas about painting and he really didn't know what to do with the surface and I kept saying, well, why don't you just do it yourself? You can do it. And he said, no, 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 you should do it for me. You should do it. And slowly by slowly, he's now doing it himself and he doesn't really need me to do it anymore and that's really awesome. But I love collaborating. It's one of my favorite things to do and it was really fun to work on his work. The next few slides are images, are part of my production line. I make a whole lot of work. I've, to make it easy on myself, I have a, a series of different objects that I work on and then within that object I make a whole range of paintings on them and everything's one of a kind. <clears throat> So usually I make about 25 plates at a time. It might make, take me a week or two to get them done, so you can kind of have a sense of how much time I'm putting on them. I like to work in series. For me, it's the easiest way for me to free up my mind 
in the beginning it always seems a little tight and then I just keep going and I get more and more into it and a little bit a little bit obsessed maybe almost anything can trigger trigger an image for me this is an image of one of the ways that I make a living I do I work with galleries I also do craft shows, I guess you could call it art show, craft shows. Um, sometimes inside, this would be in a convention center, sometimes outside, sometimes I do a street fair. So this is what uh, my display has looked like in an inside kind of show. And this is just a funny picture I put on. I was uh, doing a show in New Orleans and I met a girl, she just walked at the New Orleans Jazz Fest and she came into my space and said, you know what, I look like this piece. <laughs> And I said, you know what? <laughs> Actually, you do. I guess it's the spacing of her eyes and her eyebrows. And so I took a picture of her. But that's the kind of cool thing for me. I, you know, I, I could probably sell all of my work through a gallery, but for me, one of the greatest things is having the, um, having the interaction with the people that I sell with, making, making a connection, understanding what the work makes, means to them. And so even though I could work probably exclusively with galleries, it's for me, the work forms the end of the circle when I'm able to see where it goes when I can have that kind of conversation. These are just a couple, uh, I'm sorry, out of sync shots of Pellin School of Crafts. And the garden that was outside of my studio, which is, uh, gardening is a huge part of my life as well. Really informs my work and has given me a lot of gratitude. So after I left Penland, I went back to my studio. Looks really organized, that's just my husband. I have millions of colors that I use. My studio is probably about maybe 10 feet by, it's more than 10 by 10, but it's not very big space. It's in the back of my house. And I made a decision uh, about my studio life. In being a studio artist, I don't make a huge amount of money but I also don't want to have a huge amount of debt and I could have a much larger studio, but because I have wanted to just keep everything kind of contained, I work out of my house and I can, I've been able to make that sp space work for myself. So after I got back and I had enjoyed my residency at Penland, I had made connections there and I've had a couple chances, as uh, Liz said, to work in a couple different countries, which has been great and I, I hope I'll be able to do that more in the future. I went to Slovenia and worked for two weeks with a group of artists, um, mostly all European artists that were ceramics people. Um, it was great to get out of the context of American ceramics and work with other people, thinking about other things. This is Lake Bled, incredibly beautiful. Slovenia is a beautiful country. If you've ever been there or never been there, you should try to get there. And the work that I did there was I, I looked at all the people in the group and I did a plate about the story of all the different people that were there. And this specific plate was uh, one of the women was a vegan there. So I was thinking about that. I like to take stories, kind of mix them with my own ideas and, and create an illustration from it. <coughs> and this was just a fun thing we did. They had some very special clay that's in Serbia that can be fired pretty much in an hour. You just set a fire. It must probably has mica or something in it and it gets fired. And here's a piece I did from that. I also had a chance to go to Macedonia. I don't have any pictures of that, but um, in some places in the former Yugoslavia, they didn't have art schools, but one of the ways that they exchanged knowledge is was they would create these things that they called colonies, and they would just gather groups of people together for a couple weeks to just work together and share ideas, and um, it, it's a lovely way to meet and work with other artists. So since that time, you know, a lot of times you, you do your work and it's, it's kind of a linear thing, but unless you take the time to look at what you're doing, it's, it's hard to know exactly how you're changing. But I can see when I was putting this whole thing together that I've been getting much more and more colorful. I also stopped drawing into the clay because I, I think for health reasons, I didn't want to be subjected to the dust. So I've done a lot less digging, and I didn't want to wear a mask than I used to do. Um, 
but I started off wanting to be a painter and I still feel that I, in my heart that's the thing that I am the most as a painter. So in the last few years I've been doing more and more painting on my work. This is uh, an opportunity I had to do a show in Japan, which travel lately has had a huge influence on, on my work and it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing to do if you have a chance. A commission, something I don't generally do, but sometimes you can't say no when somebody wants you to do their dog and they make you an offer you can't refuse. These are small vases. I think the thing that excites me more, most about doing something like this, because I'll do quite a few at a time, is, is trying to think of as many patterns as I can think of to keep myself stimulated. I also had a chance to go to Paris a couple years ago for two months. Uh, I was at the Cité des Arts and uh, got to see a piece that I had been sent a picture of years and years ago in an email that I was that has huge influence over me that I love. And just be surrounded by a culture that was incredibly unfamiliar but very, very rich. Just some shots from a couple uh, museums I visited. So a lot of my work combines is anthropomorphic. There's sort of an element of animals. There's usually an element of humans. Pattern. It's my garden in Chesterland where I live this year. And my greatest inspiration, which is my new dog. This is a plate from last fall when I was a teaching at Penland School of Crafts. And I think the last few pieces are work uh, that I've probably done in the last six months. So sometimes my painting is really specific and sometimes it's can get pretty molecular or spatial. Mostly I just try to trust that I'm on the right track. I know it's easy to doubt what you're doing or to have a lot of confidence, you know, both sides of that. But my philosophy is just to work hard, maybe reflect later possibly be surprised by what you didn't know was happening. This is a collaborative piece I did with a friend, um, which I also had in my studio for quite a long time, and I didn't know how to address it, and then, and then I figured it out. Salt and pepper. I make a lot of forms that have a functionalness about it, and I would say that probably the, I'm not necessarily that drawn to pottery, but I am drawn to having a vehicle that can connect to people. So if it takes a bowl with my image in, if it takes, instead of being flat, if a bowl is the thing that makes sense for people to be able to kind of bring it into themselves, then that's okay with me. Pretty much I don't have enough time to do everything I want to do. I, I'd love to do a lot more sculpture, but it's, it's hard, you know, being a self-supporting artist to always get to do what I want to do. So my studi studio is really tiny, pretty much on the other side of this table, maybe by two feet is the other wall, but I have a huge window, whoops, I have a huge window, so it doesn't feel like I'm working in a small space, it actually feels like I'm working right there in the forest. And um, I think because of that, I'm able to work in the small space. I think if I had four walls closed, it would feel really incredibly closed in. But um, the window always makes me feel like I'm out there. And it's 
just kind of a fun thing I did this year. Trying to figure out something that I could connect anybody to. <laughs> Oh, sorry, that's blurry. Uh, I was just, uh, there was just a little article written about me in American Craft, and this is a photo from that. And uh, a few shots of inspiration, <coughs> what kinds of things I look at. Um, if any of you are into Pinterest, I'm a total freak, and oh, I'm just admitting it. Um, and if you want to see, I have about 12,000 pins. I love. Well, when I make my work, I don't necessarily look at other things. I like to look at a lot of things when I'm not making my work and just kind of let it, you know, come in through my skin and, um, and just kind of uh, brew in there. So I have a whole section on patterns. A lot of times I like to make up patterns, but now I've realized, you know, I can take from other patterns too and collaborate with them. Um, this is an artist. Her name is Sandrine Rovini, and she's a French artist. Uh, who I think is kind of a visionary. Her, her work is totally amazing to me. It's, she uses herself as a reference in nature and there's something about it that to me seems incredibly honest and it's something that I also aspire to. A piece of folk art. I'm not using my computer right now so I can't tell you these people's names but you can find it in my Pinterest if you want. Or I could tell you after the show on my computer. I think this is glass and ceramic. Kiki Smith, who I admire. Christina Bothwell. I love her combination of materials and imagery. Illuminated manuscripts and Indian miniatures and Persian miniatures. I love all that work. I'm not necessarily trying to do that, but it, it, I can really feel it. And um, I also sell my work on Etsy, which um, has been a great venue for me. And I, I bought a piece of work from this woman. I was sort of intrigued by it. I didn't know what it was. And uh, it is a little doll, but it is her work is so incredibly exquisite in person, in person that it, this doesn't really do it any justice. Every piece of it is touched, and I love that about it, every stitch. Um, her name is Paulina Thames. There's a million great illustrators out there that I never had any idea about until I started doing um, research. And Elsa Mora. and I don't know how to say her name. Her name is Jana, or Jana Bright, who's a young painter from Latvia who I have been quite inspired by. And Ansems. And that's the end. Thank you.